Hello. In a couple of my previous videos, I talked about archaeological measurements and assignment of artifacts to categories on the basis of a classification. Usually the next step in an archaeological analysis would be to take the data that result from those, those uh, processes and enter them in a, some kind of computer database. It's very important to make sure you design that database very well in order to avoid a lot of costly mistakes that are very difficult to correct down the road. This video will introduce you to some of the concepts you could use to make sure that you design the database in such a way that it will meet your objectives and not lead to those kinds of mistakes. Today, the computerization of archaeological data even begins as early as fieldwork. For example, many archaeological surveys employ tablets to record data about the sites and artifacts that they find. A database on the tablet allows surveyors to record characteristics of sites, such as their environmental surroundings, what kinds of artifacts are found there, and so on. A nice feature of many of these databases is the ability to take a photograph and have it immediately incorporated into the data. This allows surveyors, for example, to record ground cover of the land that they're surveying. It's also increasingly common for tablets to be a feature on archaeological excavations. That not only can the camera on the tablet be good for taking record shots, but fields in a database can be used to record the sediment characteristics, the stratigraphy, and other features of the deposits that archaeologists are excavating. When we're making observations on artifacts in the lab, quite often we have a laptop with us right at the workstation so that we, we, we can record various uh, attributes of the artifacts directly into a database. So uh, we might be uh, making observations on bifacial tools like these ones here. Uh, some of them might be caliper measurements, right, the width, width at the midline of the tool. Uh, some of them might be angles with a goniometer, such as the angle of the working edge of the tool. Uh, we might make observations on the characteristics of the raw material. We might use a Munsell chart to characterize the color of the raw material. Uh, and we also might uh, make observations that are on uh, dichotomous or uh, ordinal scale things like quality of material on an ordinal scale, or presence or absence of certain kinds of features in the retouch, for example. So when we do that, we would then, for each of those measurements, we directly enter it onto the database using the laptop. And then later on, we would upload it probably to a major, uh, a main database uh, that's held somewhere else in the lab. Now, one very simple kind of database is called a flat file database, and it's analogous to a set of file cards. It has very little structure to it. It's basically each record is on a card, uh, and we have a set of cards that we kind of organize in some kind of sequence. So it looks like a box full of file cards. And in fact, we sometimes still use file cards in archaeological laboratories, although we wouldn't use them as our main database. Here, for example, I have a file box that contains a number of file cards that have been used for drawing the kind of rough drawing or the initial drawing of potsherds. So we have, in, a, in another video, we'll talk about how we illustrate pottery. But here we have information on the diameter of the pot, the cross-section of the pot, uh, and a drawing of some decoration on the pot, and information about the context, the artifact number, and so on. And we can also scribble on here any extra notes we want to make about slips and that sort of thing. But these are later scanned. In the case of my project, we would take these and then scan them and put them in a computer to draw, do the final drawings. And also any information that was notated on here, we'd make sure it was also in our computer database as well. But essentially this is a simple sort of database that can come in handy for uh, because most of the pottery that we have to draw is small enough that it can fix, that the, that the drawing can fit on a file card like this. And it's particularly simple when, as in this case, the shirts have already been sectioned for thin section analysis or petrographic analysis, a topic we'll deal with in another video. So here we can see some nice details on uh, the cross section of the pottery. But it also means we can lay the pottery flat on the file card and very carefully trace the outline of the pottery, uh, which gives us a rough drawing that we can fix up later on on the computer. So I'll replace that card where it belongs here. Uh, in this case, we have to manually sort the, the cards in their numerical order to make it easy for us to find things. And you know, each card has another drawing. Uh, this is a good example of one that has uh, extra notations on it to give information 
to the illustrator, but also we want to make sure that the information gets entered into the electronic database, uh, database that we have somewhere else uh, in the lab. I'm sure most of you are familiar with spreadsheet software. A simple spreadsheet is a good example of a flat file database. Each row in the spreadsheet records a single record, just as the file cards do in a file card system, while each column represents a different attribute or field. Typically, the first column is used for a key attribute, in this case, artifact number, which uniquely identifies each artifact in the database. Other columns are used for various attributes measured on interval, ratio, ordinal, or nominal scales. This can work well when there are only a few attributes, but when there are many, it requires a lot of scrolling around. Highlighting individual rows and using freeze panes to keep the key attribute and column headings visible all the time makes it easier to navigate. However, spreadsheets tend to be better for displaying and archiving data than they are for data entry when the number of attributes is great. Furthermore, they're not as well suited for making relations between different kinds of data. For most archaeological projects, and especially large complex ones, a relational database is much more suitable. This allows you to manipulate data with something called SQL, or Structured Query Language, which is common to all modern relational databases. However, a common mistake is to sit down in front of some database software and begin setting up files and fields for things like sites and attributes of artifacts without first thinking things through. To design a really effective database, it's best to model it in the abstract before you physically arrange it on a computer. A useful tool for this is an entity relationship model. Entities are categories of data, like sites or artifacts or excavation units, and there are relationships among entities. For example, sites contain excavation areas and stratigraphic layers contain artifacts. Both entities and relations have attributes. In this example, we have a sites entity that has among its attributes a unique identifier, a site type on a nominal scale, and some kind of indication of the site's location. Another way to model an entity is with a structure chart. This uses a rectangle to represent the file and lists the various attributes that are used to describe individual records within that entity. At the top of the chart, we see the what are called key attributes, site number and site name. These are unique to each record in the file. Below that, we see other attributes and information about what scale of measurement is used to describe them and what kinds of data in the database we would use to describe them. In this case, A stands for alphanumeric and N for numeric data. The relations between entities are kind of like verbs. In the case of excavation projects, sites have or perhaps contain excavation units. The line segments that connect the entities to the relation show the characteristics of that relation through what is called crow's foot notation. The single short line segment at the left end of the relation and the multiple fork-like uh, symbol at the right end of the relation indicates that a single record in the entity on the left is connected to multiple records in the entity at the right. For example, in this part of an entity relationship model, every single stratigraphic layer in the layers entity at left is connected to multiple records for artifacts in the artifacts file. That's because each layer could contain hundreds or even thousands of artifacts. Returning to the structure chart view, in this case we have two entities called contexts and lithics with a relationship between them. Notice that the key attribute in the context file, called layer number, is connected to the attribute pointer, also called layer number, in the lithics file. The crow's foot notation indicates that many different lithics in the lithics file could belong to the same layer in the context file. The short double line segments at the left end of this relation indicate not only that there's only one layer number for each group of lithics, but also that it's a required relationship. In other words, every artifact has to have a stratigraphic context. 
a shorthand way to describe the roles of the two entities in this particular relationship is to think of the context file as the one file and the lithics file as the many file because there could be many lithics in each context. Using databases involves flows of information between entities, between entities and processes, and as a result of user queries. Consequently, another useful tool is called a data flow diagram that documents these kinds of flows and helps you plan for them. Here, for example, we see a portion of a data flow diagram documenting the process of sorting. This involves flows of information from the entity's artifacts and context into a process, a sorting process, and then output from that process, which might involve putting data into a series of separate files. Although these diagrams are really designed for flows of data, they can even be used for flows of artifacts in an archaeological project. For example, they could be used to plan for and later document the flow of artifacts from excavators to a laboratory, to conservators, to illustrators, photographers, and eventually to a storage area. But their most important role is in documenting and planning for flows of information. Close attention to data flow diagrams could help you avoid bottlenecks that might impede your research. Once we've worked out a good data model for our database and decided on all the characteristics of the attributes in each entity, we can begin to set up the database physically on a computer. For example, having worked out what should be the key attributes and other attributes for a sites file and what characteristics those attributes should have, we can begin to define it in the database. We'll start out by creating a key attribute for site number. And notice that even though it's a number, we're setting it as alphanumeric because the numbers are purely arbitrary. Because site number is a key attribute, we can't allow null values because site number is mandatory for each record. We also want site number to be indexed. That makes it easier to look up site numbers and to sort the data. This particular software also allows us to place comments on each attribute. For example, if it's a ratio scale attribute, we might want to indicate what the units are, or we might want to refer to the protocol for measuring this particular attribute. Later, these comments could be incorporated into what's called a data dictionary that documents all the characteristics of the database. Modern databases allow us to design forms, both for the input or data entry and for the output or display of data in the database. In this case, we see an output form that looks a lot like a spreadsheet because it has a rows for each record and columns for each attribute. But note that here it's only a selection of attributes that are shown in the columns. We can select whichever attributes we think are really important and omit others. By selecting one of the rows, we can also look at the input form for that record. Since this input form happens to be from a site entity for an archaeological survey, it contains a number of fields or attributes that relate to the location and characteristics of the site. If we want to enter a new record, we're presented with a blank version of the data entry form. We can set this up to look a lot like a paper form instead of being arranged in rows and columns. We can group fields on the form in a way that makes sense. We can also set up the form in such a way that hitting the tab key allows us to switch from field to field in what seems like a natural sequence. An important feature is that we can put filters on the fields that prevent certain kinds of data entry errors. For example, we can insist that the first two characters in an entry have to be alphanumeric letters, or that there has to be a hyphen between two digits, or that the range of numbers that can be entered is restricted. We can also arrange for certain kinds of things to be filled in automatically. 
We can have default values on some fields that show the most common site number, for example, that we can always uh, replace with a different one if that doesn't apply. And we can do things like having a slash mark or a hyphen automatically occur between characters in a field. In some archaeological labs, in order to help the people working in the lab make consistent uh, attributions of various attributes on artifacts, we use a kind of guidebook, a, pro a protocol that's recorded on a binder or something like that, and, and uh, people working in the lab go step by step through the pages in the binder to help them record the attributes on the artifacts. So in this particular instance, we'll look at pottery. So we have here a, a manual of sorts uh, that has little diagrams and drawings and so on to help the people in the lab assign the attributes correctly and accurately uh, to each artifact, in this case, sherds. So and we also uh, sometimes use forms uh, like this on which to record the attributes. Other times we might record them directly into a laptop or something like that. But here, just to show you the, some variety of how things are, can be done, uh, we'll do it with a form. And uh, I should have a pencil here somewhere. Oh, there it is. So we'll take the first shirt here and we record starting with its site number and then its contextual information within the site, and the individual artifact number. Uh, then we're asked on this particular form to record the form of the artifact, and the guide here has starting with zero for unknown form, uh, closed or restricted form, probably a jar. So that's what we have here. This is a jar rim. Uh, then segment. The segment in this case is rim. So let's turn to the rim pages. Oops. rim is one. Stance for the rim is slightly inverted. Whoops. Inverted is one. The profile uh, refers to the curvature of the upper part of the vessel. In this case it is slightly concave, I guess, which would be two. Spout. There's no spout, so leave that as is. Rim lip shape. So that refers to whether or not the, the actual lip is rounded, flattened, or something like that. So in this case, it is rounded. So we'll look and see that would be two. Um, symmetry is whether or not it's the same uh, on the interior and the exterior, or it's a little bit off, offset or lopsided. Uh, in this case, it's a little bit lopsided. That'd be symmetrical. Um, it's, well, second thought is pretty symmetrical. So that would be one. Rim inflection uh, has to do with whether or not the rim bends outwards or inwards. In this case, it pretty clearly bends outwards. So we want to have this one, which is seven, which has no handle. It's not a base and so on, so we can skip that. Then we have to measure its diameter. And we measure the diameter. In this case, we'll use exterior diameter. And it looks like it's about seven centimeters. Exterior diameter, uh, which is 70 millimeters. Um, the rim height, in this case, since we have a, a fairly fancy kind of rim here, we can measure our rim height on it, which in this case is about 13.8 millimeters. Um, inside rim diameter will skip since we have an outside rim diameter and skip, oh, that's the wall thickness. Wall thickness on the body part of the shirt is 12 millimeters, and, and then we would record various aspects of the section of the pottery from macroscopic observation. We'd see what kind of inclusions there are and so on and record them here. We'll talk more about that later. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit and I'm going to use a different shirt here just to give you an idea, but we can follow this through. There's a separate section in the manual for bases, handles, and so on. 
But let's go to some decorated shirts just to give you an idea how that would work. So this particular shirt actually has what some people would call thumbnail decoration on it, which would be, um, which would be, which would be four impressed decoration four. So in the decoration part of the form, we would put decoration type would be four for impressed decoration. And then there's information here for patterning of various kinds of patterning. So some of these shirts have uh, crosshatch painting on them. Actually, I think it would be this type 12. And this one's also burnished. So there's a place here for surface treatment where we, record, we would record that it's burnished. There are places to record colors of slips and the fabric and so on. So we record it all in this form. And then later on, we would uh, transfer that information into a computerized database. But as I mentioned, some people would record the information directly into a laptop. Whether or not a project uses paper forms and later transfers the data into an electronic database or enters the data directly into the database, it's useful to be able to use forms on the computer that look a lot like paper forms. Here we see the digital version of that form we just used to record the attributes on a jar rim. One of the nice things about this is that we can make the form on the screen look exactly like the paper form. This particular database uses a lot of numeric codes for some of the attributes, even though those attributes are on nominal or ordinal scales. This was a common practice many years ago when computers didn't have very much memory capacity, and this database was actually first established in the 1990s, so that's why the codes are there. Nowadays, it would make more sense to represent nominal and ordinal categories of data with drop-down menus. Here we're entering some data in a new record. When we finish entering all the data on the form, we can either click on the check mark at upper left here in order to save the record, or we could click on the X to exit without saving, for example, if we think we made a mistake on the form. Along with filters and default values on attributes, drop-down menus can be a very useful way to reduce the number of errors in data entry. These present a menu of allowable values for the attribute. To make use of drop-down menus, we need to establish lists of all the allowable values for each attribute. Here, for example, we want to set up a nominal scale or set of categories for site type. We add each category in turn typing in the name of that category, and standardizing the spelling of that name. Some kinds of entities and attributes that archaeologists use don't lend themselves very well to, de to description on a simple numeric or alphanumeric scale. Some of the more problematic attributes are ones that have to do with either space or time. For example, we might have time periods like the Archaic period or the Early Bronze Age, which could be described on an alphanumeric scale. But there are problems with that. First of all, a typical database would sort such periods alphabetically rather than in chronological order, which is not very helpful. Secondly, it's not uncommon for various archaeological sites to have multiple periods of occupation, so how do we describe the multiple periods in a single field? One possible workaround for the first problem is to put a numeral at the beginning of the name of each period. This allows it to be sorted in the right order. As a workaround for the second problem, you might, instead of using one field for the time period, use a set of multiple fields that can be displayed as checkboxes. 
For checkboxes, you'd want to set the data type to Boolean field, which is the kind that describes dichotomous data. And we need to establish a separate field for every period or subdivision of period that we think is important. When entering data, we can then check all that apply to represent all of the periods that are present. However, this still doesn't solve the problem of uncertainty in our attribution of time periods. For example, we might be uncertain which phase of the archaic period is represented in a particular site. It's important to decide how you're going to deal with these kinds of problems in the design stage so that you can apply the same set of rules throughout when you start to use the database. Just as important as designing the database is documenting it. This kind of documentation is called metadata, or data about data, and we can record it in something called a data dictionary. For every entity, relation, and process in the database, we record its characteristics and any limitations on its use. For attributes, that would include scale of measurement, units if any, and the expected range of values. For a flow of data between entities or from an entity to a process, that might include how often we would likely make use of that process, how, what kind of data would be involved, what kind of processes would be involved, and perhaps what people would be expected to make use of that flow. I hope that video helped you understand some of the basic concepts that you need to consider when you design a database for an archaeological research project. Sitting down in front of a computer and building the database physically before you've thought those things through is usually a very big mistake, and you, it's much more costly and difficult to fix those mistakes down the road than if you got it right the first time. If you want to learn more about this topic, you can read about it in a lot more detail in Chapter 4 of my book, The Archaeologist's Laboratory, published by Springer. Thank you, and stay safe.